Cara, benvenuta, e tutti, benvenuti. I practiced my Italian just for this moment, and I'm raising a glass of Prosecco to toast Lisa. Lisa and I have been together with all of her books, I think, of Everywhere That Mary Went, which published in 1993. We met at the Eggers in 1994, and ever since. But this is a departure from the Lisa Scottolini books that we've been talking about for going into, well, more than two decades. Right. Uh, Lisa, Lisa, you've described this a book called Eternal as the book of your heart. Why do you say that? Well, first off, sit. Everybody gets to sit. All to right. all of you, to Barbara, to Patrick, to the whole gang, to the best damn indie in the country. Mm. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much for doing this. Now yeah. I forget the question. We're already off and running. I love it. Um, let's start over again. And I will say you have said that this is the book of your heart. Tell us why you say that. Well, I think in a way they all are because you know me and I am open. So they all come from within. But this was an idea that I had 30 years ago. It's not, that's wrong. It's 40. It's in college. And I took a course with Philip Roth at Penn. In fact, I want to show you a picture I took of him in that course because I was the yearbook photographer. Look at this. Oh, this wow. is like an artifact. This is like from 1975, right? I'm old enough to get a vaccine, guys. And uh, he taught me about, uh, well, he taught us all this seminar, only 15 people, and we read all these incredible books. But the theme was pe behavior in extreme circumstances. So the Holocaust came up and he kind of introduced us to the work of Primo Levi, an Italian chemist who was also Jewish. And I learned then about the Italian Holocaust. Now I'm Italian American and I would, didn't even really didn't, you know, Italy is called the forgotten front. And in any event, that has been in my mind. And the more I learned about it, I learned about this thing that happened in Rome. And I know you are a world traveler and all of your audience knows that. And I've been to Rome and didn't even know about it. And it took place in Rome. And I said to myself, one day you're going to write about that because it really does. I think of it, and then I'll shut up, a little bit. I want to say it's the same thing, only different, which is not a great pitch. But what it is, is I've always written, it's been 30 years, Barbara, 30, bo 30 odd books and nine memoirs about family and love and justice. And Eternal is about family and love and justice. It's just set in fascism in Italy. And so that's the same thing. So I really think people who've read me before will love it. It's going to feel like Denunzio to them. It's going to feel like Vendetta Defense. But it's different in this way. And this is a really important, I want to make this point at the outset. There were real victims in this historical event that I didn't know about, that I think a lot of people don't know about. And I really wanted to honor them. And, you know, their names were taken from them and I want to, and they were turned into a number by the Nazis, by the fascists first. And I wanted to, you know, you, where, where is justice when the perpetrators are gone and the victims are gone? With a justice, what can you do? And I thought, you, and I know you are very driven by that too, as a former lawyer, recovering lawyer. And it was a little bit, I was like, I want to bring justice to that situation. So what I can do is tell their story. And eternal is their story. That it really is. That's me thinking out loud, but I think it's really, really true. I'm not sure when people go to Rome, as I have done various times, that they really think about the Jewish quarter. Uh, there's a wonderful synagogue in Rome, but the location, yeah. the location of the Jewish quarter it was not a salubrious one, as often happened. Um, it's down by the Tiber, and there's a exactly. massive um ruin of a theater who said the I'm trying to remember Marcel, the theater Marcel. of Marcel or whatever yes. it is right nearby yes. um, but it's always worth touring now I'm an Episcopalian and my husband comes from a very distinguished Jewish family and when we travel you will love this I don't think I've ever told you this here's how it goes I tour all the synagogues and Rob goes to all the churches because he's in love with stained glass so so I mean it's really <laughs> strange that I am the one and then I, I send all the photos I get to the Kellermans Jonathan and Faye because oh, cool. uh, you know they they enjoy that so over the years i've collected i don't know how many synagogue and synagogue photos but but rome i think lisa people don't really think of the jewish quarter they don't really think about the synagogue it's not like on the bucket list of things to do in but rome 
And what's remarkable to me, and I had gone there first, I'm lucky enough to be published in Italy with my books. And my Italian editor took me there and she, let's go to the Jewish quarter. It will have the artichokes. And, and that was wonderful. But I also realized when I started to learn the history that had happened here. And what's so fascinating is like the synagogue that is there. What I really learned, which is remarkable to me because you think Rome, Roman Catholic, it's the seat of Catholicism. Rome is also the, the oldest continuously existing Jewish community outside of the, in Western civilization. Do you understand what I'm telling you? It's huge. And I go, that is so fascinating because when you think about what happened under fascism and leading up to World War II in Rome, you know, fascism didn't start life as an anti-Semitic movement. And Jews, Italian Jews, who believe very strongly in their Italianness and their Jewishness, joined the fascist party in the same percentages as Gentiles. So it's only when Mussolini, and it's so interesting to explore fascism, but joined with Hitler that it turned anti-Semitic, anti which only made the betrayal of the Jews in Rome and Italy so much darker. You know, they were stripped of, there was a whole series of it, uh, kind of barrage of anti-Jewish laws, but the cruelest one was the one that stripped them of their Italian citizenship. And that's what you really want to portray. I think this book portrays that at a human level, you know, through the characters. It's sort of a, well, you tell me what you think, but I think it's sort of a, a romantic story of three young people who fall in love with each other and a young woman who is coming of age in fascism and trying to decide what to become and who to love and has to choose between these two men who are both really terrific in their own way. And um, ha how, what happens to them as the specter of fascism overtakes them? You know, to, to portray um, something as vast as World War II, the betrayal of Jews in Italy, other, it's mostly been Venice that people have written about. Joseph Cannon right. wrote a brilliant book about the Jews in Venice and so yes. forth. But in order to really make that accessible to readers, you need to have a focus and a small focus, people's lives. So right. what you've done in this book is that you, you have a love triangle and it's young love. Right. It's young love when, you know, people's lives are just getting started. They haven't, they haven't really got a clear track towards what they're going. And so it's a combination of friendship and romantic love. You have a young woman who's the pivot, Elisabetta, right. and then you've got two young men, one of whom is Jewish, one of whom is not. And, you know, there they are. Um, and, and so I think you start in 1937, if I recall. Like so that. we're going to walk our way through this awful time and through right. the war with these characters and then we're going to see them live out their lives as they have been shaped by the war as they grow older and figure out their past and i i think that's the key to your story is that you relate to these characters and they take you through these momentous events Whereas well that's what you hope and thank you for yeah. saying that and also you see their families you know because that older generation it's remarkable to think how World War I ended and then it's like only five years later or something like that, the next one starts. It's interesting because in my course, and as I, I think you know, I taught a course called Justice in Fiction. I start them vis-a-vis -vis Jews in Italy on Merchant of Venice, Shakespeare. That's the seminal, what is a Jew? You know, what is, hath not a Jew eyes, that incredible speech. And, and what I really wanted to look at is, as you point out, it's young love that starts and young love, you know, every book, to a certain extent, a lot of the stuff I write is about identity. And so what's happening in Eternal is partly who she chooses is partly who she is. She's trying to figure out who she is. Of course, the war sets all of that back. And it's who are, it's back to Philip Roth. What is your, how do you conduct yourself in an occupied city? How do you conduct yourself? You know, you have Marco, who is the sort of sexy cyclist um, who has a secret and he's going to kind of become a fascist. And I think you're going to understand. I'm not going to give any spoilers, but you kind of understand why that happens. Right. And there's Sandro, who's um, I discovered I went to Rome. I went to the mathematics department. I talked to a professor there and I learned about a man named uh, Tullio Levi Civita. And he was the Einstein of Italy, and he was a contemporary of Einstein's. And in fact, he corrected one of Einstein's paper, which pissed Einstein off, and then the two became friends. And when you understand, for example, the story of 
when the Nazis come, or this actually happens with the fascists, and the, in, the Jewish intelligentsia, professors at all fields, there's a colossal brain drain. What the world loses when hate wins is profound. But as you say, you have to show it on a personal level. So we have Elizabetta, who might remind some people of Mary D'Annunzio. And in the beginning of the book, she's going to get her first bra. And so I had to figure, you know, do all the research. How did you, what were bras like then? Um, I put one on for you. I always talk about my underwire bra with you guys. I don't know why. <laughs> and uh, maybe I, have, I don't wear any. I know I wore it for you, Barbara. Thank and you. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I had to, um, and I said to myself, should I be putting this in a historical novel? But the answer is, it's still in one written by me. I'm no different. I'm a thriller writer. I think it moves like a thriller. And I also have to personalize, like you said, you have to personalize that story. She is a young girl coming of age. For a lot of us, that might mean, when do I get a bra? When do I get a first kiss? When does all of this happen? So it was really fun to write. Everything's fun to write and also a struggle to write. But to get the history right and to do honor to these people who were victims, it was really important to me. Well, watching them navigate these terrible times and, you know, I mean, dangerous and fatal times um, is really important. But I'm thinking, Lisa, because one of the strengths of, of your books, all of which, of course, I have read since, as I pointed out, we've been together from the beginning. Can I just interrupt you to thank you and just tell people, because there's probably going to be a lot of new listeners to this, that. From my first book in 1994, you called me up and you said, I love this book. You were the first bookseller that did that. And I was amazed and grateful. And I've been going to Scottsdale ever since. And I love it out there. So I, I, but I'm so grateful to you. Well, so go good. ahead. And, and I am grateful to you too for all the wonderful times that we've had together in the reading. But what I wanted to say is that you've always been great on backstory. You've always been great when writing your thrillers. Um, you know, you, we start in the present. There's always an instigating incident or whatever it is makes the story go. But you've always been wonderful at filling in how we got there. Uh, and not all writers are good at that. I mean, this story is interesting to me because it's a forward progression. You didn't, you know, you're, you're not doing the backstory thing. You are starting and you are moving it forward. And so, you know, there's, I mean, the big buzz about this is your first historical novel, but it's more than that. This is a different structure to the book in that sense. That's really true. Yeah. That's um, very kind of you to say. I have something I want to read to you because you have a huge fan among the sales department of your publisher. Oh, and it is. Yep. And one of them said to me that she was moved to write to me because she listened to the audio book. And here's what, because she works there, she could do it early, right? So here's what she had to say to me about you. I will tell you that it was one of the best productions, i.e. audio, I have ever, ever experienced. I kid you not when I tell you that my heart ached a few days after I finished it because I missed the character so much. Lisa weaves an epic, ambitious historical that conquers the time, politics, war, even food. You can tell, feel all that she has poured into this project. Isn't that wow. lovely? Well, that's really, that's wonderful. And, and it's nice about the audiobook too, because I love audiobooks and the, the readers for this are terrific. But I kind of did. I mean, it took me a little longer. You see, I didn't have a book out last April. Oh, that's a first for me. I miss it. And, but I wanted to bring everything to bear. And at the same time, like, it's nice that she, you know, the idea of the food too, like it's, it's still everyday life. And unlike the thriller, which I love writing, I'm working on now. Those will take place in about a four day period. This was 20 years. I, I actually, it's nice she said epic and I don't wanna sound like a jerk, but I really was trying to write an epic. I mean, I know that sounds crazy, but you can't, well, it does a little, it sounds, well, I don't know, but I, but I was like, you can do it, just try. <laughs> and, but it really, I honestly think it took all the practice on the job. You know, I'm a great fan of novels, as you know, I mean, you're like a fiend and, and I love how carefully you read and, and thoughtfully you parse things. And I really wanted to bring everything that I've learned because it can't be, here's the history part. 
You know, it just can't be, or it's not interesting for it to sweep you away as I think this does. Like we're talking about the serious parts, but there's food and there's music and there's art and there's all this stuff that's Italy. Why people love going to Italy. When I watched the Stanley Tucci, I don't know if anyone's watching that with, he eats yeah. the food. Every time he eats, he's like, oh my God. I'm like, yes, oh my God. I, I went there when I was doing this research and I, I um, had a pizza at a very, this was not a fancy restaurant. That's the great thing about Italy. And you're in this crappy place and they give me a pizza. And I took a bite of this pizza and I cried. And I'm like, oh my God. And I grabbed the waiter. I'm like, this is so good. And he's like, leave me alone. But honestly, that feeling, that Italianness, that emotionality, which weirdly Mussolini used, you know, he's that ultra patriot that's going to say, we conquered the world. Therefore, we can do whatever we want. And so it has a dark side to it, but it also has that wonderful, uh, you know, that wonderful flavor. I wanted, I want you to taste the tomato sauce and the fresh basil. So that's right. right. And, and have a pizza while you eat it, splash it on the page. However, I, I do that. that. Wait, stop. I forgot the commercial. Don't do that while you're reading one of our autograph copies. And Lisa, please hold up a copy of Eternal. Ta-da, it'll be backwards, but this is it. I just no, it's saw not. It's, it's it forward. It's all just fine. And the reason oh, I good. to do that and I'm not doing it is that our many dozens, well, hundred plus books are somewhere between Lisa and the poison pen right this moment. I signed them. Uh, These are all blurbs from the most amazing authors. I just wrote all these historical fiction authors that I've been reading forever and said, you know, would you mind reading my book? And they were incredibly welcoming, which is really wonderful. Paula McLean, Chris Bajalian, Mark Sullivan, Christina Baker Klein, Pam Janoff, Adriana Trigiani. And I'm very proud to have Dr. Stan Pugliese, who's an expert on Italian Jewry and has written about it. He vetted the book. He made sure I was right. I was only got one thing wrong, which was a street name. Awesome. Such a, such a geek. So yes. when, when you and I were talking about this book quite a long time ago, last fall, in fact, we corresponded about it. One of the things that you pointed, I'm, I'm trying to remember whether you wrote about it or how it all came up. But anyway, you are an author who loves sentences. And I, you know, you really like writing sentences and crafting them and so forth. So did you find that was different writing this story with its linear progression and all the rest of it than it was writing one of your denuncio books? You know, that's so interesting. And of course, you always ask this brilliant questions. Honestly, it was completely different. In fact, because what I realized when I was writing it is that, listen to how I talk, right? I talk like who I am. A lot of the characters tend to talk like this. You have to distinguish them, but it's a contemporary voice. And when I started to write this, I said, you cannot write this in a contemporary voice. And one of the reasons it took me so long to write, which I was loved doing all the research, is I read novels of the time, you know, um, everyone I mean and I I wanted to absorb the locution the the simplest thing you know like Elsa Morante who's a very famous Italian writer of the 30s Italo Calvino and there are just so many of them Silvio Moroni I can't but my Italian's horrible but for example here's I said oh well, I noticed that they use little turns of phrase. Like for example, Elisabetta, you know, when she doesn't, she doesn't have a bra, all the other girls have a bra, they make fun of her. I will tell you that happened to me. That was actually from me. So, cause I always say you have to put some emotional truth in these books. And she, one of the phrases Elsa Morante used was the girls talked behind their hands. And I thought, well, that's not something we say anymore but that's what, if you're gonna write in voice that is not an anach anachronistic, so in a way, it's not a voice that readers will used to for me. Parts of Vendetta Defense, when Pigeon Tony talks, will sound like that because I did the same thing there. But to do it for like, you know, a whole book in, in, in both the guy's voices and hers was cool, but, very, but a fantastic exercise. And I think, I, I mean, I, I'm proud of it. I'm proud of the way it turned out. You it's should be, you know, I mean, let's face it, the person who should be happiest with this book is you, and the person who should be enthusiastic in talking about it is certainly you. And speaking of enthusiastic of talking about it, I think you probably have fans all queued up who would like to ask questions and not just have me gas on here. Mm -hmm. So um, we're going to turn this now to the Facebook question part, and I have a little surprise for you in order to do that, which okay. will come on just in a moment, I think. There may be a slight, slight delay here. 
this is I love this. This is the moment where I feel like a jerk. And there it is. There ah! she is. So hey, hey, how are you? And now can you hear me? Yes, yeah. perfectly. So now I'm going to uh, turn this up. No, is that working? Is this fun, everybody? Is this really fun? Do you, you want to exit and re-enter? I can't. I can't Maybe believe I can how screechy my horrible Philadelphia accent is. That's what I can't. <laughs> Maybe I can help here, Hank. Um, on the on the Facebook thing itself, if you just turn the volume all the way down on the yeah, Facebook turned thing, it off. that's turned that's what I've done. I think it's working now. I hear. You hear but too. Hank, can you see you the know question? What? I'm going to go out and come in again. Yeah, yeah just go out and come in again. Not the best that you've ever right. had. Oh, it was a bigger surprise than I planned on. <laughs> My signings are always spontaneous with you, and I think that's fun. Just turn the I think if I think if you exit, Hank can come back in. It'll be okay. I think it's there. We go, and there we have it. Nice. You look beautiful. And there we have it. Right? Is this working? Mm -hmm. Yeah. How about that? This is my many years of technical skill in all kinds of ways. Is just coming to the fore right now, right here. So I can say to you, cento di questi giorni, which Aww. I am told means, may you have a hundred days like this. And congratulations on Thank this so wonderful much. book. You are, I have a classic right here point. in my little hot hands. Oh, nice. It Thank is you. Gorgeous. The cover is gorgeous, you all. I the know, book really like is it. gorgeous, you all. It will make you cry. Um, I'm really just here to, to forward some of the questions from the readers and I'm gonna sneak in some of my own if Barbara doesn't mind. Absolutely. All of you who are listening on Facebook, forgive us for the technical difficulties. Not let, at least that lets you know that we are here, here live and we're enthusiastic. Um, and we absolutely love Lisa Scottolini who is really one of the most, one of the premier, most generous, loveliest, funniest, craziest, most talented writers that we could possibly imagine in the world. And we've all loved her books for moment one, but then she comes out with this, which is you, such a much. work of passion, Lisa. You know, I, I'd, I'd love to know before I ask the author questions, how were you writing this? I mean, I can't imagine, I can imagine you writing all of, you know, your series and your wonderful standalone thrillers, but I wonder if your whole self yes. felt different writing. I, I don't know what happened to me, but I was obsessed. I, I can show you like my, uh, I have, I, I bought uh, every book about Italy about the time period. I read it. I chased down artifacts. I even purchased the, uh, cause I wanted Elizabeth in the book is wants to be a writer and she has a typewriter. I was like, I need to know what that sounds like, that typewriter. So I actually bought the typewriter. Um, I would get it, but then you would see what crappy pants I'm wearing, which is very sad. <laughs> and I watched every movie of the period, you know, um, it was, it was total immersion because you had to channel so much more. It was such a different period. And, uh, but I loved it because it's, and the food, of course, you know, I'm you know, making pasta like as I going out of style. I'm well, drinking wine. That's, yeah. that's, that's, that's all research for the book. That's all research. But I, I imagine your brain sort of blossoming with this book. I mean, you're the, the queen of plotters and the queen of emotion and the queen of loyalty yeah. and family injustice, as you were saying. But also, um, this is, you know, so now you decide to tackle philosophy and the reason for living and how we make the decisions that we make and what does loyalty mean and what does belief mean and I mean that is a that is a challenge and a responsibility for you right to put into this book in a story about real people as Barbara was saying these big big and I don't want to say messages but messages without feeling I think they're heavy. themes right it's yes, a thematic themes. thing it's like what are the questions you're going to answer? And now if you've written like 30 some books and you have, you, I love your books, as you know, and you go, what have I learned? What level can I take it to? Let's really look at justice writ large because you know, well, I've written crime fiction all my life. Well, this is a war crime. Um, and it's one without, as we talked about, you know, without, you can't, uh, compensate people. There were, and what happened was when I was doing the research too, I spoke with um, 
an expert at the uh, Italian Jewish Museum in, in New York. And I spoke to someone there who I won't, I won't name, but I said to him, um, why was there no Nuremberg about this? And he said, nobody wanted another Nuremberg. And I thought, that's why I'm gonna write this book. Yeah. Because that, you don't get a free murder. You don't get a free atrocity. Um, you have to really bring it, but also personalize it. When you, when you really think about it, there's a lot of World War II novels. Very few are about Italy. The last one that I, um, Mark Sullivan has written a wonderful one, but not about Rome. And this, this sort of true event has really never been dealt with in fiction. Also, there are wonderful little stories that I learned that are inspiring. Like, I'm not gonna give anything away, but there is a true story about what somebody did in Rome to save the Jews of Rome, this spectacular stratagem, like a ruse that he tricked the Nazis. And, but what's so remarkable that this event happened like across the river, you know, as Barbara says, mm -hmm. this all takes place five, a 10 minute walk from the Vatican. Okay. So when you have, when you have that kind of a grand canvas, you're going to up your game. I mean, I felt like I mean, that the grand canvas is also intimidating, isn't it? You have to get it right. It has to feel right. People who know about this are going to read it. Right. You're bringing this, you know, your own Lisa sense to it, your understanding, your, your personal understanding and your, and your personal, how much you care about this, your passion for this has got to be interwoven with this big, big story. Did you, was it, I mean, you, you sit at your desk and you're typing and were you worried or crying or laughing or happy or? I was know, doing all that. I was mm -hmm. doing all that, but I must tell you, you know me. I mean, I, I do that with my thrillers as well. I mean, it's just, just it's just, just a little bit of a narrower subject. I don't want to say smaller because I think as Barbara, we've said this before, especially in crime fiction. You know, I'm not one of these authors that had the bodies pile up and now we're going to figure out who the serial killer is. I, if I, there's one murder in my book, we're going to go to that funeral. We're going to see that effect. We're going to see the effect on the family, on the community. And this is just that writ large. So I wake up emotional. <laughs> So it was just amazing. I have no estrogen left, yet I am always feeling something. And so, and you know that from crime fiction too, Hank. Everybody, we bring that heart to the story and you hope that that emotionality and the empathy, it imbues the story with, with that realism that people can feel it. And which works so beautifully. But the thing that must have been such a challenge, you know, in your thrillers and in your series, there is a bad guy or a bad organization that's some level of smaller. But now you have this massive world changing evil and hate and people who have decided to sign up for that, who have decided that that's what they will believe and mm -hmm. that that's okay because they're loyal to a thing that, someone has told them to believe or that somehow they do believe. And so this idea of how far, um, just like the, the Holocaust in, in Germany, in, in Italy, these are their own people. Mm -hmm. You know, these are brothers and sisters and families that are, that are ripped apart. Um, and people had, you know, these loyalties of your three characters are, are tormented throughout. I mean, you start, I mean, the book starts with this looming, looming moment where anyone who reads and anyone who understands life can see, uh-oh, this is, this is not going to be good. And what you want to do is you really want to, um, you know, the, it begins with this, well, I, it begins, well, I mean, it doesn't matter. It begins <laughs> with the first kiss too. So you really, she's got to, who am I going to kiss first? Who's going to be my first kiss? And I remember thinking, what's it like to kiss? How do you kiss? How do you actually do that? And, but you're right, because the reader comes to it with a modern sensibility. But what I wanted to show is, you know, unlike the, a lot of the books about Nazis, I wanted to, the fascists, first off, it's, it's mind-blowing to think that Mussolini was the first fascist party. Like he invented fascism. And I really had to understand, and I cannot tell you how much I read about this and how many people I consulted, and wanted to understand why would somebody believe that? What hooked them? Normal, good people. Part of it is patriotism, right? We are Italian. That, we, that is a very special thing. And when you can have your Roman antecedent, you can kind of go, it kind of is. Uh, you know, they, they conquered 
all of Europe they, to the UK, everything was Roman and remind you of who you are. And it was very interesting to me in a story about identity. You know, so it becomes not just what you believe, it becomes who you are. It isn't so different from an Eagles fan. Weird analogy, right? Quick left turn, but I'm an Eagles fan. I bleed green. That's what people say. I am that. And so when you can convince people that's who you are, um, then you say, well, that is otherizing. And it's very interesting because you see the beginning of the hate. Now it's hard for Marco because someone is telling him because you're Italian, you have to hate another Italian who's your best friend, Sandro. And what I really wanted to have in this novel was this is a love triangle, but it isn't a com competition. So the both boys are competing and they hate each other. They love each other. I wanted to say to the reader from the outset, this is a little bit of a no win because she, Elizabeth goes, if I choose Marco, I'm going to lose Sandro's friendship. And Marco is going, if I win, I'm going to lose Sandro's friendship. And Sandro is feeling the same way. And so I wanted that feeling of, ah, uh, oh, this is going to break my heart. It's and going also to the that. choices, the choices that people had to make, the choices that people were forced right. to make. So you take this little microcosm of the threesome and place it in the template of this bigger choice that, ev that everyone right. was having to make. And yet, and we're so touched um, by these individuals. What, one of the things that I wonder about this, though, I was, I was at an event um, a couple of years ago with Sally Field. And she was talking about how she didn't like to read the ends of the scripts that she was working on, because if she knew what happened in the end, she couldn't help but play to the end. She called it playing to the end. Mm -hmm. So you as Lisa, you know what happened in the world. No, I don't. No, but you, 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 when you were writing it, when you were writing no, you know about the war. Well, the real, the real story the real is war. the personal story. Right. But you know what well, happened. So I knew who won the war. That doesn't <laughs> matter at all. But the real story is who will Elizabeth to choose? And I didn't know, as you know, I, I never know, like people say, do you know how it ends? I don't even know how it middles. I didn't know any of it. And I must tell you, outing myself, I wrote this a thousand, this was a thousand page manuscript when I handed it in. I had the whole, talk about backstory, I had the previous generation. I, I worked through it like a mathematical proof, which I do with everything. I didn't know how it would end. So I never can play to the end because I don't know what it is. I didn't know who she would choose. I didn't know what would happen. I didn't know anything. I'm so impressive that way. I don't know Jack about anything. I just- no, I'm with you. I write just the same way. In. I write just the same way. And I think that's because you're sort of in search of the story and people have to make their decisions exactly. and people have to make their choices. And after they do that, then the story progresses. The 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 a choice is a decision and a decision is action and an action has consequences. That's, and it drives yeah. plot, right, exactly. exactly. Character drives plot. Character and plot are really the same thing. What you do is who you are. And that is true in life, but it's also true in eternal and in, in books too. So when you walked around Italy thinking about this book and Italy has the, you know, the cypress trees and olive trees and this fragrance of peaches and cheese and wine and everybody is so voluptuously wonder, you know, even as you were saying about pizza, you know, every single thing has to be the best it can be. They want you to be as happy and as enamored of the food and love you. How did you take that sort of Italianness and weave that into the book? Well, that, that great feeling, I wanted every page you to know that you were not, you're not in Philly, you know, you are, you know, and so I, when I went, when I, when my research trip, my main one, I went the same exact time of year. I wanted to know how the light was. Yeah. I wanted to know what the people wore. And also you're kind of thinking about, oh, I forgot what I was going to say, damn it. About, about the food and the and the oh right the food. The thank you Hank. it's really it's there for a reason mm -hmm. and i'll tell you which you would probably figure it out but this is a 20 year time period it food is so em emblematic of italian life italian food is so freaking great right and the people love it and savor it. it is so part of their culture that when things start to get bad under fascism and then the war comes food is rationed and I wanted that contrast. 
Uh, There's a great quote by Dante. He says, you know, the hardest thing, the greatest sorrow is to remember how happy you were in times of misery. So when you say, because there was, you know, there isn't really the definitive book about the war in Italy written. That's actually what I was trying to write. So I'm going to tell you what it's like to be in Rome and go, we're starving. And by the way, by the time the Nazis, there was the bombing campaign was in Italy because the headline was the, not, the, the allies wanted to use Italy was the weak link. So if we get bombed the hell out of Italy, they'll give up. And Italy was decimated. Its wheat was decimated. There was so much bombing in the South. That's why it eventually gave up. It's like, wow, we did not expect this. And so when there's no food, when there's no bread, when there's no pasta, the Nazis in particular targeted the ghetto. They weaponized starvation. They starved people on purpose in a country that reveres food, that lives to eat. That's why it's there. I wanted you to feel that deprivation. What is it like for them? I mean, that is the question you have to answer. And it's fascinating because you so carefully, step by step, introduce the reader to Italian food and the Italian language by balancing Italian and English and carefully sort of not quite translating, but just sort of offering um, this insight. So as you read page by page, you become more part of Italy as you're reading it, which then means Aww. as the as it gets as this as the story gets pulled out from under you, it's you, the reader, are being are living the same life. Well, that's great. Right. Right. I wanted that authenticity. And there are some things that are that don't always translate great, like um, that you have to use the Italian word. The perfect example for me is sprezzatura, which is what Marco has. Now, sprezzatura is an Italian word that means a delicious attractiveness, charismatic, <laughs> but also careless. Like it's not put on. It's this guy is just, you know, magnetic, but not studied not a poser, not a selfie kind of guy, just, you can't help but watch him. He is a cyclist, he likes to do bike tricks, he's very handsome, all the women love him. Marco has sprezzatura. There, there is only an Italian word for it. There's 55 words in English and none of them express that. So you I love that, did you love discovering that? Yes, I did, I did. And I loved, like any, look, a, a writer, but more importantly for people listening, a reader. When you're a reader, you, if the book is done right, it engages your imagination that way and you rise to meet it. You open up your heart to meet it. You go, yes, I get it. I know his black hair, his big gleaming teeth, his smile, he's sexually confident. He's all of these things. Oh my God, I'm in love. Unfortunately, it doesn't exist, but in my mind. <laughs> and you have to make the reader love him because you have to love him. She loves him. So well, just, just, just as the person from your publisher said that she, she was haunted by these people days after she read this book because, and that's you, that's you creating real people. I mean, that's kind of the, one of the magical things about writing a book like this is those people didn't exist before you wrote them and you allowed them to flourish and blossom in time. a way that even you didn't know. That's kind of amazing, isn't it? Well, I, it's very, that's the magic of books. I mean, every time we read, and that's, Barbara and I have said many times, you know, I've felt that I've been doing that in every book. Mary Denunzio is very real to me. Every standalone is very real. And then you go, oh, I'll return to them. I'll write about that again. And I'll, I've reread my own books. I mean, you go, oh yeah, they're, yeah, right. I remember that now. And that's what books do for us. They engage us at soul level and we are happy to know those people exist in the world. You know, people who have read Rosado will love this book. I am going to write Rosado again, and we're all going to slip back into those comfy, you know, slippers. Well, that's what one of that's a couple of that people, feeling. Yeah, a couple of people on the questions have asked when, whether you're going to go back to that, but that's just because they can't get enough of Lisa. And I can't um, either. Oh, that's very kind. I don't know, but I miss. I have separation anxiety from my characters, so. Well, so do we all, so do we all. Thank but I you. do think it's interesting to think about, you said that you got the, you started thinking about this, ruminating about this 40 years ago. What was it that happened to you that made you, I don't know, confident, crazy enough to think I'm gonna do this now? That's a really good question. And I'm not really sure of the answer, except that I thought you're not getting any younger. <laughs> I mean, I actually thought, wow. what you, what is life for? 
if not to try something big. And I'm not arrogant enough to think I could do it the first year I wrote. But maybe with 33 books under my belt and also the nonfiction, because and Barbara has always been such a supporter of all books. Yes. But you, 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 Barbara had my fiction, nonfiction memoirs in the store when no one else did. And I take them very seriously. I write them with my daughter, Francesca Saratella, now a novelist in her own right. Yes, a wonderful book, Ghosts of Harvard. You spoke with her. And those little vignettes sharpen my writing, but they're also about the emotional truth of being a woman. Well, so is eternal. So I just feel like I've been practicing my entire career. And then I said, you better just try. So when you sat down at your desk, where were you? And wrote chapter, oh, let's see. Right there, there it is. <laughs> I love your walls too. <laughs> Thank you. And, and you start, you type chapter one. Yeah. Did you know it was called eternal? And why uh, besides no, I, City, but I, I was feeling it. I was feeling that I was feeling because the book is a lot about time. You mm -hmm. know, that great quote by Faulkner, the past isn't even past. That is nowhere more true than Rome. Like you walk around Rome and I and everyone, every tourist is struck by it. You go, oh, here I'm walking to, into a modern store. There's a Roman ruin. There's a cobblestone. It's this incredibly ancient civilization. I was a Latin jock, so I love the classics. So you're walking around and, and Rome keeps all those, I, I learned the word palimpsest, which is a reference to medieval manuscripts. You might know it, I didn't know it, but it was the idea that when monks used to write in the manuscript, then they had to write over the top of it when they were gonna write something new. They didn't, couldn't erase it completely because it was like animal hide. So you can read underneath it the layers of time, right? Exactly. Well, that's, you can't get a better metaphor than that. And that is Rome. When, you know, when Elizabeth in chapter one looks past over the, the tops of Trastevere, she sees the clay rooftops, but she, and she sees St. Peter's in the distance, but she also sees arches and cypress trees and things have been there for 2000 years. The palimpsest is vivid and visual and palpable. So when you start to think about titles, you think, wow, why is Rome called the Eternal City? I, I don't know why other people call it the Eternal City, but that's kind of why I call it the Eternal City. And to finish this point, it is true of us. This is a family story. These are family stories of these three families. We exist, my mother is with me right now. She passed away years ago. My daughter is downstairs, but she's with me right now. We are all of us existing together. The time is conflated, isn't it? I don't want to make it sound flat because it's really open okay. and it's all existing at the same point in time. And readers understand that because we bring so much heart and imagination to things. And so it is all of a piece and you cannot separate it. You experience it in the same moment. And that's why the book is called Eternal. And when you, I mean, this is so beautiful. You're making me cry now, but when you... When you, when you tap into that, mm -hmm. you know, when you make yourself be one of the layers or that you yes. peel them back and you realize you're already there and it's also all, it's all, all the time. Yes. How does that change you as a person in looking at the world the next time you go to Italy, knock on wood? Right, but I think out. about it even here because the really the insight I had about it was that you're looking at the architecture, but what you are seeing is time and mm. it's the stories of families. And I thought about those Jews of Rome, the oldest Jews in Western civilization and what happened to them. I said, you tell those family stories and family, aren't families the perfect example of a layer, generational layer, my mother's layer, my grandparents' layer, their pictures are downstairs. My layer, my daughter's layer, her children. Well, Eileen, Eileen, one of the one of the people, one of the almost hundreds of pe hundreds of people who are attending today from Australia and Canada and all oh, over great. the United States. I urge you to go back and look at the comments when this is over because oh, I, love is just flooding all. Oh, like, nice! I love you all. Thank you. Like, you don't even know if anyone's there. I'm like, oh, oh no, they are all there, there, there and they are listening to you just raptly as Barbara and I are. Yeah. Um, and Eileen is asking well, whether you learned anything about your own family from writing this. Well, I have, yes, because I have been to Italy and to the where my father is from and where my mother is from. And I made the characters because Italy is such an interesting place in that, uh, this didn't make it into this draft, so I'll tell you behind the scenes. Okay. 
There's a lot of volcanoes in Italy. It has more volcanoes than a lot of places in the world. And there's a Sirocco wind that comes in at certain times of the year and actually spreads volcan from the, it's in Africa. And it sets a layer of volcanic dust. And there's earthquakes in Italy. There's a very turbulent physicality to the land. My mother is from Abruzzo which is a province where there was a very famous earthquake there. And I made the, the, the characters, the Marcos families from Abruzzo. I wanted to bring in that volatility because I think there's something to that. And that honoring of family and that emotionality that is so much a part of the national character. And I think also that I look, it's not an insight I got from writing this. I think it's partly an insight we all have from this very difficult time we're in with this pandemic. We see families, we know that families are affected. There is no better, more awful example of how are we're interconnected than a virus. We have to isolate one from the other. It's heartbreaking. We find a way to find each other. I'm reading more than I ever have before because I'm finding that consciousness and that humanity of other people. So all of that is happening at this time. And I think we are learning this and processing all of these things together. They're the same themes and the same ideas. And that's why they're epic because they're so universal and they're so timeless and they will recur. And we will look back on this as we are now looking back on fascism or the Roman empire. The and glory of that because around. somebody, Mary was asking whether writing historical, Mary B Baker was asking whether historical fiction was more difficult. And I, I think in talking to you, I'm hearing that yes, there, you know, there's the research and there's the making sure that everything is correct, but there's also that historical fiction is our fiction. It's our lives. You know, they're your relatives and my relatives who were in Europe at, at the time of the war. And every time anyone reads this, they have a personal connection to the characters here, whether they know it or not. How, how do you feel about well, that? Well, what's amazing to me is that that's a very nice thing to say, but the truth is it's everyone's families because war touches everyone. We have all, right? My father served weird stories that I've written about. My father served, you know, was in the US Army Air Corps at a time when my grandparents who were Italian immigrants to this country had to register as enemy aliens because Italy was fighting in the war. There was a point in this novel when Italy, when it had surrendered and couldn't decide which side to join, the Italian Romans were bombed by the allies and the Nazis. So these touch everybody. You don't have to be Italian American to know that. And these themes will recur. And that's why I wanted to write about them because they touch everyone. I know and, that message, and the message to the extent that there is one, um, you know, because I thought about it a lot and I said, this sounds corny, but the truth is the opening quote, because I think about these quotes a lot, it's really love conquers all. It is about love and the power of love in contradiction to hate. You know, you start to otherize people and then you're forgetting that you are them. Their family is your family. Their children are your children. And so those, those issues, though, it's not about my family per se, I learned about. I learned about everyone's family listening, our family. And my dad was in the Battle of the Bulge and was taken prison, prisoner by the Germans. I remember, I read that on you. I remember reading exactly. about that. And he had carried a book of poetry with him in the war. Um, and when I asked him why he did that, why he carried this anthology with him, he said it's to remind it was to remind myself there was beauty in the world. Right. And that, you know, that is such a powerful, he had to decide whether to tell the German prison camp guards whether he that he was Jewish or not, had to make that decision. You, you know, those kinds of um, crucibles change right. all of our lives and that's what and that's what your book is about you know i love what are you hearing from readers what are you hearing from fans about well, journal? i was very i'm so far the reviews are wonderful and the reader i must tell you i'm a review person as barbara will tell you i read the reader reviews on goodreads <laughs> yay it's so great the reception because i was this is let's be real this is a risk i have a i have, I have a very I'm very lucky to have so many readers come with me book to book. And I hope they will come to this one. I know they will love it, but it is a little different. And I um, want to try new things. And I think I grow thereby. I think they grow thereby. And I'm really excited that the reception is so good. I mean, that's a wonderful, gratifying thing. And the point is, like you were saying, you know, if when you think of what's eternal, love is eternal. 
these emotions are eternal. And I feel like the reception to this book proves that. I mean, it is because Lisa, and I know Barbara wants to, to, us to stop talking, but it is a <laughs> she good, <laughs> it is a good story. That's the that's the Lisa Scottolini element of it. Oh, thank like, you. You know, thriller or epic the way this is, it's a good story. And you're a wonderful storyteller. And I think reviewers and readers um, are responding to that. I mean, who doesn't want to dive in to a story like this that will wrap you in its arms and envelop you and not let you go? That's what that's why we read. Well, that's very kind of you. I really wanted people to be entertained and swept away and transported and feel those, smell the great tomato <laughs> sauce. I mean, you get so hungry. I was, I ate so much, <laughs> but that's really what I wanted. And I, I appreciate you saying all those nice things. And you too, Barbara, it's, it's a really big deal for me and I'm really excited about it. And I, I appreciate your, your kindness and, and the readers who are here and listening, I love you all and I really appreciate it. I'm, I, I'm a count your blessings person every day. Of my actually, life. I wasn't actually trying to stop you both as to interject something, which <laughs> is, um, and it's not easy when you're, too, <laughs> but I'll persevere, right? Um, I, think, I think it's important. We keep talking about this being an historical novel, mm -hmm. but it's weirdly contemporary. Lisa didn't know about the pandemic. Lisa didn't know about the tumultuous politics that overwhelmed us all. But the truth is um, what she's writing about is really today just as well. We have been through experiences where, where our lives are, are affected by events we can't control, by you know people that uh, are making decisions we don't agree with. We are forced to live together in a different way. And um, the things that we would normally pass the time with, we can't do many of them. And so we're, we're turning inward, we're reading more, we're doing a lot of things. But Lisa's point, which I really agree with, which is that even in war, everyday life had to go on. You still had to try to wash your clothes or mm -hmm you know, feed your, or, or cook, or, or do any number of things. There's a wonderful book, um, who was it? Robert Harris wrote a really brilliant book called Enigma about England during wartime. And I still remember the most powerful thing he had to say was how everybody smelled because there wasn't really any soap. You know, you couldn't send your clothes out for cleaning and it was gray and it was smelly and you were hungry. And, you know, I, I'm not sure how many wartime novels really captured that day to day kind right. of experience right. that, you know, you have to think about how to survive. But at the same time, you can't lose all the joy. People still have sex. They still have babies. I mean, we're talking pandemic babies. We're talking pandemic puppies. I have, I have a, an older puppy. It's not a pandemic puppy, but you know, I worry about what will happen to the pandemic puppies when we can go back out again. Will it be like Easter bunnies? You know, will people, you know, it was great to have the bunny, but now it's July and we don't want to take care of the bunny. Will that happen? And you know, what are we doing there? So, we're really revisiting on a global scale once again the sort of things that you are writing about in this book. So to call it historical, it's true. But if you don't like that idea of historical fiction, you can read it basically as a contemporary novel. Absolutely. Because things are, are very similar. Hank, were there questions that you wanted to read? I'm looking through them. Um, I think people are loving what we're talking about. So, um, so we've covered them essentially, right? So the, the two questions that we always get and that we always have to address, which Lisa's answered one, what are you writing? And you're, you've already told us that you're working on another novel. And the other one is, you know, is there any movie, film, television interest in either the work you've already done or in this book? And if so, can you answer that? We have people buzzing around, which is wonderful. And I can't say more than that, but that's very, very wonderful. But as, uh, as I always really believe, I wrote the book and I'm super proud of it. And um, just to add something, because I do want to pitch this and tell people, you know, this is lemons and lemonade time, right? And as you say, it's a pandemic. And I love that we can do this and that people from Australia can come. You know, yes. there's, and, and one of the things I'm doing with this book is, you know, I always have a book club party at my house and everyone's like, well, I can't travel to Philly. Well, we're doing something different this year. And I want to take a second to tell people. 
um, and they can find the details on my website. But the bottom line is this, we're throwing open the book club party. So everybody, if your book club reads the book, and we're also doing it for if you're not in a book club, so bear with me. If you're in a book club and you read the book, follow the rules, just hold up a picture of it. And I'm gonna pick 25 book clubs to have virtual, to have a virtual book club with them and only them. And so please enter. And also, let's say you're not in a book club. I wrote, I decided we're going to call it the acapella book club, which means without accompaniment. Because I live alone and I'm not in a book club and I feel bad for the readers. That, so what we're going to do is you should get the book, enter for the acapella book club. We're going to make a book club for you and you will get a 25 person signing too. And by the way, the last pitch is to pre-order this book from Poison Pen, which has signed copies, and enter the sweepstakes for it. Because on Tuesday night, I'm giving away a Gucci purse for pre-order. So where so, do we go? Do we go to I your know. website? We go to your website. Go to my website. And there's and all the information is there. Wait, oh, hold on. I got I have a visitor. Okay. okay. I'm gonna give a shout out to Hank, who has done remarkable things while all of this is going on. Hang on a minute. Uh, Hank, tell us about your first chapter project, and you've done some other things to uh, reach readers and help other authors. Oh my goodness, that's so nice of you, Barbara. Thank you. Well, you know, one of the things, and Lisa was talking about this in the pandemic, that our lives have changed so much, and the way that we deal with people is so different, and the way we deal with reading and discoverability and talking to authors. So the fabulous Karen Dion and I have started a, a program called The Back Room, which is a panel of four authors, um, and it's sort of Zoom up close and personal. We only let 80 people into each event, and you can really talk to each individual author and um, check our website, thebackroom.org for that. And Hannah Mary McKinnon and I, a wonderful best-selling author from Canada, have started First Chapter Fun, where every Tuesday and Thursday at 1230 ET, we read the first chapter of a new book out loud, live, what can go wrong? So that's that's first. I mean, the other day, the other day, um, Hannah was reading and her her printer just started printing. You know, and somebody came to my door and it's just like, whatever, this is real. Sure. Um, but it's a wonderful way to um, just hear the wonderful first chapter of a new book that you might never have heard of, all the while still writing my books. But again, like Lisa's book club, like Lisa's book club, you're saying, I hear you, I see you, I know you love books, I know you love Eternal. You know, Lisa has been so generous with her book club parties, the tents and the people, and it's just, um, really phenomenal and it's um incredibly generous of you to just keep no. doing this it's well, I think, too. I, think what it, I think what it really speaks to is what we're talking about which is a desire to connect mm -hmm. people belong together and we need each other and that makes us happy and so you your puppy. <laughs> she was making noise. I'm like, oh my God. No, mine's locked up in the back room. I'm my little, making my little uh, unfortunate noises. But. I was interviewing someone once who had, whose dog learned that if the dog came into her Zoom, she would give the dog a treat to quiet her. <laughs> Well, that was a big mistake because she trained the dog, of course, to come in and bother her when she was on Zoom so the dog would get treats. So. Um, a cuddle is much better, I think. Who is this? So Lisa, we haven't we mom? haven't summoned up your daughter, but um, since you're a proud mom and we're talking about family, you should take a moment here to tell us about Francesca and her wonderful debut novel. Oh, um, you're so kind of Harvard. Um, I spoke to Francesca in an event like this last summer, and her book was one of our first mystery books of the month. That Did I mention wonderful. that Eternal is our April historical fiction book of the month? Did I mention that? No, really? Oh. I did, which is why you signed so many books. That's oh my God, an thank you so much. Oh, well, that's so it's funny. a pleasure. But tell us about Francesca and Ghosts of Harvard because that's got to be wonderful for you. Oh, it's so wonderful. I'm so proud of her. Well, look, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful, the story is, is so compelling and short. It's the story of a woman who, uh, a, a young girl who goes to Harvard in the wake of her brother's, uh, her older brother's suicide there. And he had been really a brilliant guy, like kind of a genius, but also unfortunately had a mental illness, schizophrenia. And he ended up committing suicide on campus. And she goes there and she kind of wants to get to the bottom of his suicide, but she starts to hear voices herself mm -hmm. and wonder if she's losing her, you know, if she's, she's going to go the same fate he did. 
And uh, it's called Ghosts of Harvard. It's really terrific. And thank you for having Francesca. It was very well received. The reviews were wonderful. And people really embrace it. And she's working on her second novel now. So I oh, mean, please don't talk about being a mom. You know, your daughter has this wonderful book. What was it like when you read it, when you saw it? When you saw <laughs> it was it amazing. Was it was amazing. But I'll, I will refer you to a quick story about my dad who came to, when he was alive, came to my signings. And someone said, you must be so proud of your daughter. And he said, lady, I was proud of her the day she came out of the egg. Oh. And that's exactly how I feel about Francesca. She didn't have to write a book for me to be proud of her. Oh. And I've been looking at her little rainbow picture she brought home from school since day one. And I, uh, you know, I'm very, very happy. Look, I think it's, it's in a way, not everybody becomes a novelist. If they want to write, they should. You know, I really encourage people. But I think everybody finds their own voice. And what happens that that changes over time. Here I am at my age going, I want to try to find a different voice. I want to try to do something different. And what does that mean and can I? And I think the answer is yes, and we all should try it. Anything we want, we should try. Life is too short. And just hold on to each other and whatever little critters we are lucky enough to live with. Well, I can tell you from looking at the comments that um, Donis and Donna have both said, I love the ghosts of Harvard. Oh, how nice. Says, Ghost of Harvard was a marvelous book. I loved it. Marilyn oh. says, I enjoyed the ghost of Harvard. Everybody's going on and on. Oh, that's so um, great. I'll tell uh, Francesca uh, she'll watch this. This is, right. yes, do tell her to watch this. Um, and Lisa says, both sets of my mother's grandparents came from Italy. Italy is on my bucket list. Um, and Anita, these are pouring in right now. Your legal thrillers are so spot on. I love each one of them and the ethical questions they present. And that is, but that is what happens in Eternal as well. Right, it's Just exactly. as much a thriller with just as big ethical questions about big well, the, justice and big loyalty. Exactly, what happens when the laws are themselves unjust? Then when the laws perpetrate injustice, what then? What happens to civilization writ large? That's what we're really looking at. And that will happen. That happens in wartime, happened in this country in wartime. You know, when Japanese Americans were interned, these were American citizens of Japanese descent. Well, so we, that's why, you know, history enlightens us. And I'm, I'm thrilled to be, uh, you know, to be out with Eternal and talking to you guys. I really, really oh, care too. Back, it was very back, nice. When you think back to Primo Levi and Philip Roth and who you were in that moment, in your life and in college. And then you look at this now and look at eternal. I mean, that is a, you know, that is a, a legacy that you have fulfilled for yourself. Do you feel that? That's a, no, honestly, that's very kind of you, but I feel like it's a miracle. And you know who it's due to? The people watching this. Mm -hmm. And Barbara, who put my book into people's hands and said, you should read this lady. I was started out in paperback. I, I wasn't in hardback. And my career has built over time because of wonderful booksellers like her and wonderful readers like the ones I have. And that's just really a true thing. So that's what it is. It's just built on love. It's love. That's I a wonderful way that. to end this. I'm gonna summon Patrick back up from the deep or wherever he is so he can sign off. But there's one other thing I meant to say when you were talking about Rome, the thing I remember that I like the best about Rome wandering around is it still has SPQR. On yes, the covers. I and love I that. Think that is bridging, you know, so many white on the manhole covers I love that. yep but they still do it spqr -S -S those people they built to last they really did, they patrick, did. Do you have anything you'd like to say to wind us up here yeah patrick we're getting way too emotional here yeah <laughs> <laughs> now, this has been a wonderful program and uh thanks hank for being such a damn pro Yes, oh my really. golly, what an it honor. Such a I wonderful job thank you hank and thank yeah. you barbara and thank you patrick and everyone here Indeed. So let us wish you all a wonderful rest of your weekend. And I'll remind you that our autographed copies of Eternal will be wandering into the poison pen midweek. And they will then wander out to you. And we don't going to have super numbers left. So try to order one as quickly as you can. Yes. Um, it's a landmark book. And it's a really nice book to have Lisa's authentic signature. Um, signed at home. We didn't actually have a statement. I wrote it very nice, too. I wrote very nicely. Nicely. Thank you. That's lovely. Great. Anyway, thank you very much, Hank. I can't thank you enough. And I'll be talking to you several times before your next novel comes out in September, I'm sure. Because you. You, are, you are really 
the perfect hostess. I mean, yes, thank you so much, much Patrick. You it are such it. a pro, and I'm so glad that you were willing to sacrifice your husband's Saturday night event, whatever it was. <laughs> and when you say, do you want to come talk to Lisa Scottolini? I think we love each other. You know, yes, we do love <laughs> you. Right. Well, it was it was great for you to be the surprise guest. So I'm deeply yes, appreciate thank you, Hank. All right, thank everybody, you guys. enjoy the rest of your tour. Say hi to Paula for me, and we'll we do. Will, um, we'll talk soon, all of us. Good night, everybody. Love you guys. Good night. Congratulations. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Hello. We hope you're enjoying our programs and podcasts with authors. We'd like to expand them, and your help would be appreciated. Please make a donation at poisonedpenfoundation.org. 100% of the proceeds will go to help connect authors with readers in this difficult time. Thank you.